the reason I want to do the interview was because you put together two great words, data and storytelling. I'm going to start a lot further back than I usually would with our um, business clients, if you like, or, 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 or usual tech media. Because of your background in particular, Dean, because of uh, VizWorld, I want to go up a little further. Uh, and start with maybe some of the anthropology of image, some of the anthropology of visualization. ARIA started, and the natural language generation technology started 30 years ago. Um, if you think that AI started maybe 50, 60 years ago with the first uh, efforts to get computers to simulate things that uh, people can uh, do, the natural language generation started 30 years ago. It was started by uh, Professor Echard Reiter and Dr. Robert Dale, uh, both of whom now work for ARIA. And it comes out of a, or, or evolved into a school of com computational linguistics, and it intersects image and it intersects visualizations at a level that uh, I think is quite fascinating. It's, it's fascinating for me. I'm, I'm a, I have an anthropologist background, and, and it's this the old idea of visuals or seeing was that um, lights reflected off an object and that light enters your eye and somehow goes through a process from um, the receptors at the back of your eye through uh, a series of nerves to your brain, to your mind, and is somehow decoded there and an image generated or projected onto your consciousness in much the way a camera works. Now, of course, in the last 10 years, we've seen that that view of how sight works, of how visual stimulus drives understanding in the mind is wrong, is wrong. What's actually happening in the mind is there is this theater being constantly created, a movie being created from data that your senses are picking up and putting in, in including, including your, your uh, data that, that are captured by your eyes. So what you are actually seeing is the past, about half a second in the past, and it is entirely a construct of your mind. It's not literally seeing what's there, it's constructing. And just to prove this to yourself, just look at the way you see. If you flick your eyes around and if, if, you, if you turn your conscious mind to what's usually happening unconsciously, how your eyes are jumping around, this will be old hat to, to most of your readers, I'm sure, and to you, Dean, but the, you, you, your eyes are roving in such a way that it would be impossible for them to be getting a nice, clear, steady image. Yet, you're seeing a nice, clean, steady image. And that's because it's not really an image, it's a construct of your mind, taking these snapshots of data all the time, um, the, the focal acuity of that mentally constructed cinema is sharp at the middle and rough at the edges, not because of the technical process of your focus, but because your, your mind is prioritizing the data and it's constantly looking for what are the most relevant things. So we know that's how sight, the physical process, turns into this mental uh, way of understanding the world. And understanding is the key thing. The connection with language comes when one understands that the ability of a human to even differentiate the seen world or to accurately create that mind cinema that represents reality is entirely dependent on language. So a child's brain develops the ability to differentiate a physical object noun from an action that's happening in the visual field, verb, through language. Into language is apparent. The differentiating ability to discern the visual stimuli is just not there. It's chaotic. So it's not that language comes later or that there's somehow sight and sound that we eventually learn to describe with language. It's language itself that causes the brain to develop that allows us in many ways to understand the world and build that visual and, and audio picture to the richness that allows us to convey information through uh, visual stimuli that isn't just light, dark, predator, run, and so on. That's where we start with natural language and where we start with stories. So what we are talking about at ARIA is the content on the internet and uh, how... Uh, Artificial intelligence is still mute and hasn't caught up to the ability of humans with the su supercomputers that are in their brains, not just to see the world, but to understand it and explain it. To understand. 
I think it's very interesting considering the, the amount of work that's going on with neural networks, which are in imitation, essentially, in my understanding, most of the imitation is about learning uh, image recognition as the, as the starting place for machine learning and so on and so forth. But uh, right. I really like the way you, you link the, the idea of it. It has to move out from the chaotic to be organized by the process of, of developing language. Well, I would, I would love to talk a lot more, Dean, at some point about that, that neural network development and, and, and visual um, uh, identification, visual recognition. If you look at how, the, it, so there's the difference between simulation and uh, generation or, or, or emergent intelligence. Mm -hmm. And human consciousness doesn't emerge from sort of uh, the, the neural pathways being constructed by a reflection of how light and dark uh, or, or the statistical referencing of physical stimuli, which is what supercomputers are doing at the moment. They're simulating recognition, but they're simulating it via massively crunching, matching right. statistics. Right. Right? That's not what the human mind does. It uses experience, sure, but it employs heuristics. That's, that's why we can trick the mind so often, right? So our technology, natural language generation, that natural that's key, we're about heuristics. So we don't start with your data and work back. We actually start with you, with the person, and, and I'll explain how that works, and their language, which is how they think. So we put human thought into our system rather than statistical mapping and matching, which, which those sort of visual recognition technologies use. To, to maybe justify my point, I'm not trying to prove anything here, I'm just trying to sort of justify our, our, our context, but to justify my point, note this, most of the content on, on the internet is still human authored. So just think about what you're actually interacting with on the internet. Um, beyond the YouTube videos and so on, on, on a daily basis, you, you're reading newspaper articles, yes, you're reading stock reports, you're reading um, uh, itineraries, you're reading menus, you're reading product descriptions, you're reading and interacting with things that are written ultimately by a person. By far the majority, because there's over 90% of what's on the internet is human author. Even this internet of things is just basically data with a dashboard, how hot's my fridge, um, what's in my pantry, uh, uh, the, the television talking to my phone, the thermostat in the house talking to my phone. It, 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 there's, it, it's static data transference. To get the real understanding of what's happening, you usually need someone to explain. You need to have uh, uh, an interlocutor between the data and yourself. So, so let's take the pantry idea, for example, in the Internet of Things. I might be on my phone and I've seen an app lately from Samsung where the fridge will tell you what's in the fridge. That, that's static content. If I want to engage in a conversation with my refrigerator and have a chat about what recipes might be created using the the, the, the things in my fridge, language has to come into it. I have to be able to say things that aren't just speech recognized, but allow that thing, the refrigerator in this context, to talk back to me mm -hmm. naturally in a way that I understand. We can't do it just with pictures, can't do it just with um, references. They need both. They need the pictures and the narrative. So content is still static. So what we're also talking about when we talk about natural language generation is real-time communication from the Internet of Things that's dynamic. It's not just data captured and relayed. It's I'm interacting via language because I can't draw a picture for my fridge about what I want. I need to be able to talk to it. NLG and Ari's contention is it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the, the content on the Internet, 90% of which is, is human-authored, 50, 60, 70% of it, our technology can generate. Because the data's there, mm. it's just the computers are done. They're, they're not, they haven't been freed to talk. The systems haven't been free to explain. Our contention is this, a data set cannot explain itself. Now that might sound like heresy, Dean, for your, your listeners, your subscribers, your viewers, that, that where we're, we're, we're imbued in a visual world where uh, we're, we like infographics and we like, we like pictures. But our contention is no matter how good that picture is, no matter how good the data visualization is, um, 
of anything. There's usually still somebody there saying, now, this is what you're looking at. Let me explain what you're looking at, even if it's a, a, a cover. Now, some, some visual um, uh, taxonomies have got to the state where we don't need someone explaining because they're so obvious. They're almost hieroglyphicized. So the, the weather's a good example. Everyone knows what a cloud with sun peeping out the side or a cloud that's crying means. And, and the whole world of emojis, but um, still people prefer a written weather report. We'll get to that in a second. So chart may represent, sorry, you've got a question. I, I, I don't well, know how long. I was, just, uh, I was just going to agree with you. I think the, I think the reason that infographics are, are such a winning way of presenting statistical information is that, is that in theory, they, they follow the ideas of sequential art and that they tell a, a story that has a beginning, middle and end. And so, it builds context, it guides the reader through, as opposed to, I'll use your word again, almost this chaotic idea that when you, when you first look at even just a, a straightforward chart, you still, you still need guideposts and guidance to understand what you're, what you're viewing. You're absolutely right, you've, you've absolutely nailed it. And you've called out the thing that is so obvious to us that we sometimes forget it's happening. It's actually part of our unconscious. When, when you said a good story, the way that we communicate, the way four and a half billion years of evolution has designed us to communicate, these smart primates, is with stories. Even sentences have an implicit story structure. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a subject, a predicate. We're entirely designed to follow that arc time's arrow through a narrative to explain cause and effect. See, absolutely, that, that is what makes an infographic right. And you'll hear me talking about uh, the conveying of information through that story arc structure in a set. So our contention is language can provide the explanation. Usually you need an expert to explain it. So now let's look at business. Let's look at businesses that have spent millions on ERP systems, on CRM systems, on getting data in real time about the performance of their financials, about the performance of their sales team, about performance of their mission critical equipment, pumps, turbines, generators. Those businesses still require a person to explain what's going into the charts, the infographics, the tableau visuals, the, the, the business insight stuff. The engineer explains the systems data, the accountant, the financial data, and so on. There's a person there explaining it at some point. Infographic is a bridge away from that, as, as you've said, but then still someone has written the, the, the text, the narrative on the infographic. Our contention is that the systems themselves can generate the language, the, 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 the information in that graphic. So we take data, uh, and we explain it using language. And we do that via a technology we call the NLG platform. Uh, the platform becomes the expert. We, we, we would talk to you, Dean, about your expertise. We'd look at what you write. We'd look at what data you've used to get those insights and write up your insights to it. And we'd put in into our platform. We give a narrative and extension uh, to any data any service that developers build, that's our, that's our contention. So, so this is what it looks like. This is what we're busy patenting it. This is a, a visual representation, if you like, of what your mind does, and interestingly, I think, what our platform does. It takes in data, and uh, to make the point where you see it says language on, on your far-facing right there, that language is the first point we're actually getting words. So. What your mind does and what our system does is this. It takes in raw data, right? So uh, let's, we, we, we might use weather data, right? And then it, it, it takes that weather data and it says, what are the facts within that data? So a typical data fact would be um, this temperature at this time signal has gone up by one degree. That's a fact, right? And then it will convert that fact into a message. Temperatures increasing over the course of a day. Um, now, it won't have written that yet, it'll have just noted that within the data. And then it will do a document. So, so, so that's the analysis. So it looks at the data where it says articulate analysis as an expert does. So in the, in the case of 
meteorology in weather. We, we sat with meteorologists, we downloaded their mind into that articulate analytic, and then we, we, we let the system loose. Then it sits back and it does what you do unconsciously in, in, in nanoseconds, but which no other computer system can do. It says, I'm not going to arrange those messages in a, into a template, into mail merge on steroids, which is the limit of every other artificial intelligence out there. It says, I'm going to arrange those messages just as you do by giving it a priority that I know is important for me to communicate the facts. So you do this all the time unconsciously. If I'm asking you um, about your day, you'll unconsciously pick out the highlights and, and give me those. You won't say I got up at 6.27, I moved my feet off the bed, I went to the bathroom, I got the, you know, you, you won't give me that, that litany of data. All of those, are, but that, all that's all data in your mind is the full data set of your day. But you'll naturally, on a large level, what does he want to know about? Big chunks of information. And on a sentence level, which sentence should go first? And then which sentence should follow that first sentence? And let's make sure my second sentence hasn't got the same length and meter as the first, so that I don't get boring and lose the communication medium as I'm talking, right? So your mind's doing that super fast, unconsciously. That's what our machine does. It plans it, it sentence plans it, then it puts the final text together and finally it puts it out in language. And here's an interesting thing, it can be any language. Language globally is the, the same, same structurally underneath. Anywhere you go from, from, from New Jersey to New Mexico to New Caledonia, the Amazon rainforest, a new tribe there, everyone tells a joke in any language and puts the punchline at the end. Doesn't matter what language it is, our mental constructs underneath it's the same. So uh, our system represents that. So that's our asset. Um, I was giving you, I started with a meteorology uh, example. So here's what it starts to mean in business. And I use this just as an example because it's the, the one most people get quickly and the one that relates to visualizations. So you've seen this on the website, but, but think about how visually rich weather forecasting is now. From, from news, all the dynamic charting, you'd, uh, with, with AccuWeather, all the pretty pictures of isobars, down to on your, your mobile uh, fruit-based device, um, giving you uh, effectively graphic emojis to describe the weather. It might surprise you to know that when surveyed, by far the bulk of folks still like a, a written weather report to get the detail. UK Met Office, the world's largest uh, uh, Met service, part of the, the Royal Navy, satellites, stations all around the world, they have data for 10, 11, 20,000 sites in the UK but they only do a written report for 60. Now, that's not because they don't have the data for it. It's because um, their highly paid meteorologists take the data out of their model and physically have to write that report. Hmm. And eight of them sit in a room every morning and write those weather reports. And they only do 60 because that's all they can be bothered with. It's too, too hard to do it otherwise. And it only happens once a day. So if you want an up to the minute weather forecast or you want a weather forecast that tells you when to hang out the washing, or you want a, a weather forecast that tells you about mountain biking right where you are, or a weather forecast that says, I'm driving my truck from St. Louis through to Chicago. What, what's the weather going to be like at, at different points on my route? You can't get it, right? You, you, you can't get that level of, uh, of detail. You're left to try and be your own meteorologist and be your own expert. No longer. Thanks to the NLG platform, we, we, put the expertise of the meteorologists in and we can do 5,000 site specific reports in 72 seconds. Amazing. And, and, and more actually, that's just the chipset um, holding that back. So instantly you get this idea that there's a dynamism there. It's no longer static in terms of our communication of the data. As the data changes as it does through the day, so the report can change as the use case changes, so the, the report changes. Um, so we do it at, at scale and speed. So that's the idea there. That's real weather data and real reports out. Just have a look at that report if you can see it on the screen. Uh, you get the idea there that the language itself, the construction of the narrative is very human. It's not just saying the wind from the north 
it'll be 120 miles an hour at 0900. The wind from the north will be at 50 miles an hour at, at uh, 1600. It's, it, there's a richness to the text. It's communicating as a person would. That's, that's the key differentiator. Another quick example that we often use, uh, healthcare, neonatal wards, oh. babies in wards. Here the idea is you've got a baby in an isolate in an incubator, a neonatal ICU, so intensive care. The baby's arrived early, very precious bundle. All of the data about that baby's coming off. There's the blood oxygen monitor by General Electric. There's the heart monitor by Panasonic. Uh, there's the um, medical uh, medicinal dispensation system from the German firm Siemens. All of that's generating data in different forms and different structures. If you go to hospital, you'll see charts, right? But it's your baby. What's going on with that baby? You, the doctor still has to be there to say, this is what we're seeing. You know, you, you can't, as a layperson, pick those rich graphics up and understand them about how they relate to that so critical and well-loved child. Now, you can. So what the NLG platform does is we took the doctors, we took the nurses, we took the social workers, we put them into the system. And here we're seeing the same data generating different reports for different constituencies, different end users of that same data. Brilliant. So uh, the doctor gets a, a, a report in doctorese. You can see it's quite pithy and short. That's how doctors like it. We're not replacing the doctor. We're just supplementing their care. We're freeing them up to, to spend more time with the patients. We're doing the grunt work of filling in the forms. The nurse handover um, report has got a little more language to it. It's in nurses, for want of a better description. Yes. Saves, saves them seven minutes on average per uh, shift handover which across a big company like Kaiser Permanente is tens of millions every year. And finally, an email is sent to the parents who are having a night off at home catching up on precious sleep. And it says, um, hi, you know, it's me, baby Zach. Overnight I got a bit hot. I, I had some ibuprofen. Don't worry, I'm fine. Looking forward to seeing you this morning. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's a different context. Yes. Not templates generated rationally real time um, from the background data. So um, that's, the, uh, that's the idea of natural language generation in its business context. Let me just give you one final example of how it sits with um, in a company setting. So here we've got a, um, one of our great partners, Gempack. Now let's look at what this means. So that's great tech, all very nice, but what does it mean in a business context? So here the business context brings your viz world into our natural language generation world. I apologize ahead of time for the quality of the charting here you'll be wanting to see much sexier graphics, one of a better phrase, but uh, hopefully you'll get the idea. So here's Genpact. They work for a large, you know, they have hundreds of customers, thousands of customers globally. One of the services they offer is financial planning and analysis. So they say, give us all of your data from your Siebel system, your Oracle system, and so on. We will analyze it, and we will do reports for your board, for your management. We will tell you what's going on. We will explain what's happening in your business right? It takes them about between one and four weeks to do a board stack for any given global company describing what's happening. In this example, we're going to look at our um, uh, Cadbury Schweppes, um, just, just by way of example, uh, and how quickly can that work. So here we have the NLG platform doing the work of analysts that can take weeks in, in under a second. So here's the control board for the platform. This is how you would see it. I'm asking for an executive summary. Give me the global update on market share and raw material costs. I hit draft report, blink and you'll miss it. Um, it generates instantly this report. So this was written live. So, so look at the quality of the text. Note that the, the charting is, is dynamic. We can click on that and it can do different things. Um, uh, there are, there are there are pages of the stuff. This is just the executive. Note that it's making recommendations. So it's not just visualizing the data and saying this is what's happening. It's also saying from that which you've told us, we are seeing this happening and we might recommend that happening and so on, yeah. which is quite different to your usual BI. So BI is sort of insight. We, we give the insight. We describe what's happened. But because we're replicating the expert, because we're putting them into the machine by having reverse engineered their language their corpus of text earlier, we're also able to give um, uh, a richer view. Now, of course, that data can be done with a more detailed narrative, so please now generate the full board report for me. 
and it will generate a full board report all ready to go uh, to be sent to the board. Some of the same information in there. Note this is, it, it's called out here, for example, related articles. So it's saying Coca-Cola products have seen a 3.2% increase, but some decline, and that could be due to this. So the system's gone and found articles and used to bring in as well, as an expert would. Um, it's put a lot more recommendations in this time. It's delved more deeply into uh, um, the uh, raw materials issue. Now, just to show you, your audience might be interested in this, Dean. Uh, so I've got a, a picture of cocoa here. It's obviously spiked. Now I want to ask the system, well, great, what does that mean? What's that going to do for my end of year revenue? So do some regression analysis. So I can right click. I can add sensitivity analysis, do the regression analysis, and I don't just get a chart back, I get a description of where the business is going to end the year. So I've, I've, I've looked at the chart, I've explained it, and I've followed it through to a logical conclusion. Right. Um, and then the final one is, that's, that's great, ARIA NLG platform, um, save me the time, turn it into a PowerPoint stack for me, so I don't have to even do that. And, and you can see us doing that. So the visualizations that, that yes, communicate critical data, but also the explanation and um, the expertise applied to it uh, with the language that your mind as a person needs to truly understand. Sit down or do you want to do some Q&A? No, that was excellent and, and I do appreciate it. And I think you really got everything in there. And that was great. <laughs> Good. So I guess, uh, so I, I, I am also interested in um, um, the, the, the learning heuristics side of um, what is the training process for, for setting up the system, as it were? Well, he, he, here's the thing, right? He, I, I, again, you've nailed it, right? Any other system, you think of it, and, and this is where, Again, people sort of almost have to have an aha moment. You think about constructing any other system, computer system, analytic system, and effectively you've got to go through a huge uh, exercise of if then, if X then what, and, and build in effectively nested if then statements. You know, if you see this, do that. If you see this, do that. Everything relies on that, and that's fine. If, if you've, you've got the time to train it, you, you need your subject matter experts on hand training the system. That's, of course, how so much, so much software gets its, gets its power. You know, you've got, you've got um, uh, you, you train systems to replicate an expert, whereas the expert's the accountant or, or, or air traffic controller, you, you sort of put it in. Right, or, the the analyst or whoever it is in that particular field. Yeah, the, the different, and, and, and it takes, ages because you, you've got to model it all right the good thing about the aria system is uh the expertise is already in place in the corpus the written work that describes the phenomena that the expert can usually provide so if you think about a doctor the way the way we work let's use the most extreme example we don't need to sit with a doctor and say um if you see this What's your diagnosis? If you see that, what's your diagnosis? All we need is a whole bunch of data. So that's why we start with the uh, neonatal ICU. And then the reports that a doctor has written about that data. And what that allows our computational linguistic guys to do, our actionable an analytics, our articulate analytics team to do, is reverse engineer the, the intelligence of the doctor as made manifest in their written work back into the, the data system. Why that works so well is so often experts have things that are so obvious to them by their training that they won't actually teach the system if they're required to teach it from an if-then point of view. But with the, with the corpus, we can go, well, why did you say that? What did you mean by that? And a few examples, they go, oh, this is, oh, that is, that is and, and we can relate it. So very quickly, if we've got the corpus and the data, we can generate um, a meaningful report automatically uh, that's probably 70 or 80 percent right. So if you're a company and you say here's our data on uh, performance of a power plant 
okay, give us the data and give us the engineering ports. We match them. Within a week, we've got a system that's generating reports that sound like the engineer at sort of 80%. And then after another week of us showing him the reports and he might be saying, oh, no, I don't say it like that, I'd say it like this, or no, I'd make that the priority, that's not, we've got our system. So those are months, if not years, of if-then statement collection go. We, you know, just leave us alone with the corpus. We'll put your smarts into the system. So, so that's how we work. Okay. Yeah. You, you also need at some point to be able to evoke language, to create language from scratch in response to the data. So data, so text to text, relatively easy. You can statistically do that because you've already got the information there. Um, text to voice, uh, text to data is relatively easy. That's voice recognition, speech recognition, right? What's he or she, she saying? But data to text, that's what we do, data into language to allow the machines, to allow the internet to have a voice and explain what's going on, because it knows. It's sort of banging on the edge of the, uh, uh, of the server room going, I know all this stuff. And, and we're looking and going, well, tell us with charts or, or more numbers. It's going, no, I, I, if I could explain what's going on, your business would be better. You'd avoid that hurricane or, or what have you. Yeah, it's, yes. Of the mentally, yeah. Yes, and I think what you've what you've shown, particularly with the with the uh, with the stuff going with the baby monitors to these three different audiences that have three different ears. <laughs> three yeah, right. Ears, yeah. The same language. It's still English, and yet they have different expectations of what they want in a report, and so on and so forth. So it's very very interesting to see how you tackle that. Yeah. So, well, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. You've, been a, you've asked all the right questions. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad.